We're expecting Q3 to have more supply than Q2. We're expecting Q4 to have more supply than Q3. And we're expecting Q1 to have more supply than Q4. And so I think our supply, our supply condition going into next year will be, in a, will be a, a, a large improvement over this last year. There's only one top store across global markets right now. NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang, they're speaking exclusively about the outlook for supplies of its Blackwell AI chips. Welcome. You're watching The China Show. I'm David Inglis. Your top stories today. We have more, of course, coming up from the NVIDIA boss after NVIDIA's sales forecast failing to live up to these very lofty expectations. Now, those results playing out in markets right now with the outlook for tech stocks sending Asian shares and NASDAQ futures, as you can see, down in a Thursday session. Also ahead here in shows, Chinese earnings in focus with a big jump in profits for BYD and also Meituan in focus after sales there also beating expectations. Plus, China's foreign minister and the U.S. national security advisor discussing while well, setting up new talks uh, between their presidents to manage the strained relationship. All right, welcome to the show. A quick glance at market action right now. So in case you missed the dramatic moves in the after-hour session, here's how things effectively ended up. And I guess your starting point when you look at U.S. equity markets for Thursday is NVIDIA trading at about 30 times earnings based on this current share price. And when you look at forward EPS adjusted going into next year, it's pulled down, as you can see, the, the broader chip complex also in after hours trade. So the iteration of this in the Asia Pacific and TSMC is just coming online right now. Let's have a look at that. Some of its biggest suppliers in the region traded in Taiwan. Western is one of them too. Two and a half percent to the downside. SK Hynix down about five percent. Samsung not on your screen is also feeling quite a drag there too on the back of the guidance or at least a lack of it as far as details go on Blackwell. Uh, we'll unpack more of the uh, sort of multiple um, angles to the NVIDIA story in a moment here. Uh, how the market is looking, of course, you have some of these big and very heavily weighted chip stocks weighing on their respective benchmarks, like the Cosby on your screens, like the TIEX index, 1.3% to the downside. Overall, though, when you look at the, the damage to the benchmark, not really a whole ton, right? So three tenths of 1% is just a normal day at the office. S&P futures, though, as you can see, then that's probably where we should be paying attention to as we move into the Thursday session here. Now, the setup going into the Chinese market open is we had a very big drop in the Golden Dragon Index overnight. As you can see, 3.5%. We are getting futures coming online in Singapore, about 2 tenths of 1% to the downside. It's extremely busy on the earnings front as well today. So we'll be looking at earnings reaction. The buyback story is starting to emerge as maybe the top earnings team for this season. Dollar China, 713 there against the U.S. dollar. 3,300 was the level we were watching on the CSI 300. We took that out yesterday. We'll see if we do get some of the state support and some of the state funds coming back in to boost that benchmark above that level. We'll find out in 27 minutes from now. Let's bring in Stephen Engel, of course, our chief North Asia correspondent, is our co-pilot for these next two hours or so, Steve. It's NVIDIA Thursday, obviously. Yeah. You know, they <laughs> met or beat expectations, analyst expectations, on just about every measure, mm. but investors want more. Yeah. They're used to those blowout results. So we're going to kind of uh, have to break that down and see why the stock sold off considerably. There's some concern, obviously, over its new chip, Blackwell, so we'll talk about that coming up. We yeah. spoke exclusively to NVIDIA CEO CEO Jensen Huang, who says he's optimistic about 2025. We're going to have lots and lots of supply, and uh, we will be able to ramp uh, starting in Q4. We have billions of dollars of revenues, and we'll ramp from there into Q1, into Q2, and through next year. We're going to have a great next year as well. Mark Cranfield is with us right now, our M Live strategist in Singapore. For us, Mark, good morning. And I think we started talking about Nvidia about four or five weeks back, and finally we're here. Finally, we have the numbers. And as Steve was pointing out, it beat in almost all. But can you understand, Mark, why the market was, I guess, in somehow disappointed by, by the lack of details? Well, actually, we had, uh, we had Kriti Gupta on the TV yesterday in London saying that NVIDIA is something like an A-star student. So every time 
it does a piece of work. People expect it to produce a perfect result. So it just the expectations were probably just ridiculously high going into NVIDIA. So anything less than a totally wonderful outcome is a slight disappointment to everybody. It remains to be seen how it plays out in the US markets later today. But obviously, the indications from the after hours is not pretty, is not good at all. If a stock slides badly like that, it suggests we're going to have a pretty rough day in US markets, even though Nasdaq futures are only down modestly so far in Asia. It could well be that the month end effect is helping to moderate this to some extent. And then you've got some switching into other parts of the market anyway. So the, the difficult part is probably going to be over the weekend. This is the Labor Day weekend in the US. And it's not unusual for that period to be the time when people reassess how they feel about markets between now and year end. And it is often the time when if there's going to be bearish stories, they come out during that weekend. So by the time the US markets come back next Tuesday, it could well be that people have a more negative outlook, even though the Federal Reserve is expected to lower interest rates. People may have decided the Fed is too far behind the curve. They're not doing enough. It could look quite different by the beginning of next week. And that's when we may see the real effects of what it means when the markets are near a top. And if NVIDIA is marking a high for US equities, that obviously will have a bearish read across for Asia and the rest of the world. Well, Mark, how much does this or does this damp down uh, the AI frenzy? And what does it mean for the other magnificent seven? It's probably more a question of it, people being a more realistic assessment of it. But the AI story probably has a long way to go. It's probably going to spread to, to most parts of the world as it's been doing already. But it's more a question of what does it mean in terms of valuations and revenues? So it may well be that people reassess and decide that actually the best has already occurred. We've seen the, the biggest outperformance, the greatest relative gains are already behind us now. And from here, it's going to be more like a, a normal story. It's a bit like Apple. If you remember, there was a time when Apple could do no wrong. Every quarter was better and better and better until finally people realized that Apple was just becoming a normal company, a very profitable company, but no longer able to surprise people quarter after quarter with extraordinary results. NVIDIA maybe is on that path as well. Mark Granfield, fantastic context here, big picture out of Singapore for us, our uh, MLive strategist. So uh, with the information we have right now, the question I'm putting to you guys is, would you buy NVIDIA at this valuation at 30 times earnings? That's based on earnings going into next year, end of next year, and the price in the after hours of 117 a pop. Apart from that, though, if it's no longer NVIDIA that floats your boat, what could replace the stock as the main driver for equity markets? It's a question our MLive team is putting, of course, also to our Bloomberg clients. More on the NVIDIA story. Let's get analysis right now and bring in Mario Morales, uh, VP of Enabling Technologies and Semiconductors at IDC. Mario, good morning from the Asia Pacific. Thanks for joining us right now. I mean, you're the expert in the room here, sir. Amid the, yeah. the multiple storylines and the multiple interpretations of those storylines, what do you think our key takeaway should be here? Well, I think the key takeaway is that, that we're still seeing phenomenal growth in AI and also for NVIDIA. When you look at NVIDIA, by the end of this year, NVIDIA's revenues will reach a level that no other semiconductor company has ever reached. And if they're still committing to very good growth in 2025, you can continue to see the growth of AI being a big part of this. Um, I look at, at the numbers and why they're down here. I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were expecting the ramp for Blackwell to be faster. And if it's delayed by a quarter, I don't see any competitive impact around that. But, but you're still seeing the rest of the portfolio still looking very strong. Mario, Stephen Engel here. Are you concerned, though, by this blip, glitch, if you want to call it, uh, for production of Blackwell? I think in our interview with Jensen Huang, he kind of alluded to, I thought I answered those questions and alleviated <laughs> yeah. those concerns of investors on the analyst call. He's convinced that they're going to ramp up, ramp up, ramp up, and they're going to have hyperscalability. What do you think? I, I think so. I, I mean, when you look at this and you look at Blackwell, the next generation platform, it's a very complex uh, platform and it requires many chiplets and that is just getting more and more complex to design and make not just at the front end when you when you're thinking about TSMC but also at the back end because most of the integration 
of this capability now is, is happening in chiplets and advanced packaging. So there's so many levers that, that are going on that they have to manage and control across the supply chain. So you're going to have hiccups like this. I think you'll see other companies the same go through the same situation. But I'm not concerned. I think if you look at NVIDIA, they still control this market and will continue to, to, I would say, dominate this space over the next three to five years. Um, you know, they own over 95 percent of this market today. Mario, we want to play a, a part of the interview that we had with Jensen Huang earlier. And I think he talked about, to your point there, the demand for uh, uh, AI accelerators beyond hyperscalers. And I want to get your thoughts on whether or not you think the company is moving toward a, a broader customer base. Let's play it out, guys, please. Hyperscalers represent about 45% of our total data center business. We're relatively diversified today. We have hyperscalers. Uh, we have uh, internet service providers. We have uh, sovereign AIs. We have um, industries, enterprises. So it's fairly, fairly diversified. Mario, uh, to many viewers, that was Greek. Could you translate that to <laughs> us in simple English, please? <laughs> well, what he's saying is that we're still at the early start of AI. I think what they've benefited from so far has been the expansion across the data center. But now what, we're start, what you're going to start seeing is the expansion across vertical industries, things like markets like healthcare and retail, um, you know, the automotive industry. All of these market segments are just beginning now to experiment with AI, and I think you're going to continue to see growth over the next couple of years that will benefit not just NVIDIA, but other players that are vying for a position in the space. I think one of the other things, too, that I think no one's talking about is that so far, most of the growth that NVIDIA has, has enjoyed has come from the data center. I think the bigger opportunity on a longer term basis will be bringing AI to the edge. So think about your smartphone, your, your AI PC and your wearables, all of these different devices across across the edge are going to become AI infused and they're becoming a lot more intelligent, generating a lot more data. So I think we're just still at the beginning. I think that's where it's going to become more of a challenge for NVIDIA though, because a lot of the, the solutions and platforms that they have today are catered to very, uh, very large infrastructure. And when you're playing in the edge, you're now having, having to optimize these SOCs in order to meet the power, the cost uh, envelope and, and the, the bomb of these very low, low end systems that, that, that are getting more intelligent. Well, Mario, as you talked about, their most, I think 40% of their revenue comes from those large uh, data center operators like Alphabet and like Meta. As they broaden out, uh, should we expect perhaps, uh, as we saw with the, the stock today, it came off, should we expect perhaps a, a slower pace, you know, not as fast a pace of growth and lower those expectations uh, that they saw today? Well, I think the demand from the cloud service providers will continue to grow on a longer term basis, but it does it is lumpy demand. So they might order for four or five or maybe up to six quarters, but then you see a pause effect for them. And then, you know, but but at that point in time, we're going to expect to see the telco industry and, and large enterprises begin to also invest in their on-prem AI capabilities because they're sitting on a lot of data and they're trying to figure out at what point in time can they extract more value from that data? And they don't want to give that away to a, a cloud service provider to manage and and control that 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 potential value. So I do see an opportunity yeah. to expand in in in, the, in those spaces. Mario, the, the 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 question over competition. I mean, does the company face stiff competition now, or I mean, do you see it in for a couple of quarters from now? Do you think the bigger problem still for the company is supply chain more than competition, or or, or the other way around? Absolutely. I, I think the competition will, will probably become more pronounced over the next couple of years. I still think this is aim, uh, NVIDIA's um, market to continue to, to control. I mean, t like I said earlier, they probably control about 95% of the data center space. And one of the things that you're starting to see is that they're talking more about not just their GPU, but you're looking now at Grace Hopper and their CPU, and you're looking at Bluefield, which is their uh, data processing unit. So they're expanding their compute capability, and that means a lot more silicon in each system for them that they can continue to, to prosper and mine and grow, right? So I think the next wave for them is going to continue to be growing in the networking infrastructure space because that is also prime for, for change with, with AI coming into that domain. And if you look closely at their numbers, the networking business for NVIDIA is growing 
quite strong, over 100%, while most of the rest of the industry is, is at flat to down because of elevated inventory. So they're already gaining share in that space, and I think that's going to be the next big sec sector before we start getting into some of the enterprise and vertical segments. Mario, how do you view the issues with China, obviously, with the executive orders uh, and the export controls on the export of most advanced chips uh, to China? How must uh, NVIDIA walk that tightrope? Well, it's going to be tough not only for NVIDIA, but for the entire industry. I think when you look at that, the, the regulation, the export control is going to get, going to get tighter. And the reality still is that most of the semiconductor industry is still very exposed to China. And so you, you're going to have to figure out different supply chains that will get your products to customers working through other parts of Asia Pacific. I mean, that's what you're seeing today with a lot of the, the semiconductor companies. They're trying to find a way to get their parts still to customers. But the U.S. And, and Europe will definitely put a lot more clamps on this. And I think this is going to be one of the wild cards for the industry moving forward, I, I think, over the next couple of years. Mario, thank you for the time, sir. Mario Morales, their VP of Enabling Tech and Semiconductors at IDC. Right, uh, bottom of your screens, of course, uh, you just saw that the midpoint of the day on the currency coming up to and shows here. We'll get the latest on some of these earnings coming through out of China's tech firms grapple with concerns over the state of the economy. That's coming up next. And as we count down to the opening of trade and this drag we're feeling across tech, some stocks are likely moving against the grain, like Meituan indicated, substantially higher on the back, maybe, of that buyback it announced. More details on that story. And the open 15 minutes away, you're watching The China Show. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show, opening bell 11 minutes away, and you'll probably see a massive pop in shares of Meituan at the open. A couple of minutes, we'll probably see that also, the initial pricing there. So that's one stock to watch. Data as far as Macau goes, hotel occupancy numbers. You had a very big drop in the likes of Xpeng overnight, so we'll watch that closely. Airlines are leading your earnings parade today. We'll get more or more, more of these themes coming out. It's, it's not just in the airline space. And a, some specific levels to watch, of course, on the CSI. Uh, at 300. And of course, we're looking at uh, Meituan, of course. There yeah, you mentioned that, Dave. Of course, uh, Meituan, the big food delivery giant in China, seeing a better than expected revenue. Operating profit also is beating expectations. As people in China, in that sluggish economy, they are ordering out? Ordering in. What do you call it? <laughs> delivering to yeah. their homes instead of going out and paying uh, for the overhead in the restaurants. So uh, <laughs> we also have other obvious uh, earnings coming out of China. Let's bring in uh, Annabelle Droolers, uh, our tech correspondent who has the breakdown. Uh, May Tuan, what stood out there, Bell? Well, I think, as you say, Steve, we've seen a lot of Chinese tech companies coming through with their earnings, but, but Meituan really stood out from the pack. And the reason they managed to do that is because even despite all the risks around the consumer in China and the headwinds that they're facing, not just from people not dipping into their wallets, but also just the, the intense amount of competition that we see across a lot of different Chinese tech companies, Meituan delivered here and actually did better than had been expected. Uh, so what we saw, for instance, was core local commerce rising a better than projected 19%. The estimate had been for 17%. Overall revenue up 21% on the year as well. And the company as well announcing a $1 billion share buyback. So these are all positives for the share price, which actually when you take a look at the share price, it has been outperforming a lot of others in the space. That chart there just puts it in perspective. You've got Alibaba, JD.com at the bottom there over the course of this year. Meituan very much outpacing its biggest rivals. Yeah, uh, Bell, to your point, we're up 7% in your pre-market, substantial upside there. Going the opposite way, though, I know you're looking at other earnings, too. So BYD's down 2%. Lee Auto also out with earnings. That stock is just going off a cliff right now. We're down 11% in your pre-markets. Get us up to speed, Bell, on BYD and Lee Auto. Yeah, we might start with Lee Auto then, given that uh, significant share price reaction. And actually, when you take a look at how the ADRs performed, that sort of uh, drop that we've got so far is pretty much expected because we saw Lee Auto, for instance, down around 15%. That's May one there, you're seeing a pop. But Lee Auto, we had the numbers out and we did see weakness coming through. Overall, uh, we actually actually saw revenue climbing. But what's important is that uh, Lee Auto is really being affected by that margin squeeze. The uh, competition amongst Chinese EV makers is so tight 
tight now. And so to try and lure in more customers, they're offering these price discounts and that's very much weighing on Lee Auto's bottom line because actually when you take it, uh, shipments, they, they came in toward the, the, the upper end of the range for the latest quarter and going into the next quarter, the third quarter of this year as well, they're looking to deliver more vehicles than had been anticipated by analysts, but still uh, not enough given margin squeeze and how much that is affecting their overall bottom line. Bell, thank you so much. Bell in Sydney for us, our tech correspondent there. Right, so going into the open today, eight minutes away, Hang Seng Index, uh, your A50 futures might be getting an additional support here coming off some of these stocks coming online here. And we'll leave you with a look at Meituan in the pre-markets, delivering the goods, as they say. This is The China Show. Right, some names we're tracking in the pre-markets and we'll continue to track how these things trade, how these stocks trade going into the, the Thursday session. So the big story, at least to the upside, is Meituan after the, uh, well, for one, you had an earnings as far as results are concerned. And also, I think this is really emerging as another subplot in this earnings season is, is that buyback, right? A billion dollars. And that's simply the latest company to announce that after Anta Sports, you had uh, JD.com. Uh, yeah, Mungyo, which is the dairy maker. Before that, of course, Tencent has been buying back stock and inhaling back uh, into Treasury shares uh, recently. BYD out with earnings too. BYD Electronic missing estimates as far as that company is concerned. And Lee Auto, of course, was also the margin squeeze we were talking about there with Bell uh, just in, in the last segment or so. So we're looking at EVs very specifically too uh, because he had a very big drop. That, those names actually led the drop overnight. Xpong not on your screens. I imagine that's also going to feel some pressure going into going into the open today. Right. Um, looking at analyst actions um, and some changes here. So Morgan Stanley on Meituan upgrading the stock to, to buy. And we're also looking at uh, overweight, rather, that price target on your screens, 125. Higher Smart Home being cut. And by the way, Higher Smart Home has seen substantial downside from its peak. So 25 bucks is a price target from the folks at Jefferies. And we're looking at futures right now. Please, if we can flip the page, if we can. And the overall read-through is fairly negative. There we go. 1.7%. Uh, and it's really an NVIDIA story. It's a tech story, too. And we're just getting spooked. If NVIDIA was the top, as Mark Cranfield put it, if it is marking a top on the S&P 500, then you, know, you will get a bearish read-through across these markets. By the way, since that's done, I guess we can over-obsess now over the job support that's coming up as well, plus PC numbers out of the Fed. Anyway, that's for next time. The China Show, you're watching that. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show, counting down to the open of trade. As you can see, we're poised for a lower open and certainly the read-through from the NVIDIA results and the drop of about 7%, pulling down your some of your U.S. contracts as well. And probably that's your story going into the, the thick of the Thursday session. Um, in between, though, we're looking at earnings as well coming through out of mainland China. You have a lot on deck today, everything from Bank of China, Great Wall Motor. Um, Air China is also leading uh, some of the earnings parade. Uh, in Greater China, we're coming off, of course, some decent numbers coming out of Meituan and also BYD. The, the buyback story has also emerged as something that I think of late has been paid, I guess, paid dividends just to borrow a pun there, returning money to shareholders. So you measure it by return on equity, I guess, more than simply just price uh, appreciation. Speaking of earnings, out with earnings too was Wuliang Ye yesterday. That should be coming up bottom. Of, I think it's up 12%. Uh, year and year. The open right now is 3272. I know that's a very specific level, but we did close below 3300. I know that's a very nice round number. I'll show you why that's material uh, in just a moment. There are three tenths of one percent to the downside as well here uh, on the Shanghai comp. The latest uh, on the growth and eco front here, UBS. Um, change their forecast and change the page, please, while I talk about UBS. 4.6 percent. Uh, the latest bank here to downgrade. Uh, they're thinking as far as China goes. So we'll see what happens with that, of course. Four, and 5%, by the way, is, is where we are uh, on the official growth target, too. Okay, um, let's have a look at Hong Kong, please, if we can. HS Tech should be coming up on your screens, and that's where we are seeing, there we go, 2% declines at the open. Not completely out of the blue, given the drop we're seeing in the likes of Tencent and Alibaba. 
Uh, the, the Golden Dragon Index overnight was down about 4%, led by some of your names like Xpeng, for example, which you'll see very, very shortly. Against the grain, of course, it's Meituan. Um, 7% in your pre-markets. We're coming off a little bit, but as you can see, still substantially to the upside. Again, the buyback story there. Morgan Stanley raising that stock to overweight. Okay, um, I, pr I promise you Xpeng should be coming up there. Air China, Great Wall, and Bank of China are coming out with earnings today, down 6.7%. Lee Auto, not on your screens, was down 11% in your pre-market. So we're looking at the entire EV space today. Okay, uh, the other thing I promised before I go was the, okay, why is 3300 relevant on the CSI 300? Why it was 2840, roughly speaking, okay, important on the Shanghai, 2850 to be more specific. That seems to be the line when below which or when we're starting to test those levels that we get, we start to see some of the state funds coming through uh, in terms of the ETF purchases. So the fact that we close below that might indicate that might be, Steve, something to watch uh, going uh, going into today's session as well. All right, Dave. Well, geopolitics at the core today, this Thursday as well. Let's take you to Beijing right now, where U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is meeting with Chinese military officials. Uh, we're seeing uh, live pictures of the vice chair of the Central Military Commission of China, Zhang Youxia. Also, I understand uh, U.S. Ambassador Nicholas Burns is there, along with uh, National Security Advisor Jake uh, Sullivan. Uh, lots to discuss, obviously, as they're trying to put a floor on what some describe as deteriorating relations. Obviously, mill-to-mill -mill discussions have been uh, fraught over the last several years, uh, including through the Trump administration and the Biden administration. So having face-to-face -face, uh, dialogue with military officials with such sensitive topics as Taiwan, as well as the war in Ukraine, uh, it's good that they're meeting face-to-face. Uh, -face. This was a U.S. readout following uh, the meetings between Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, and Jake Sullivan. The U.S. said they both sides welcomed ongoing efforts to maintain open lines of communication, including planning for a leader-level call in the coming weeks. Our China Correspondent Min Min Lo will be here later to run through what Jake Sullivan uh, accomplished in his current meeting in Beijing. Well, Dave? Yeah, uh, back to the other big story, which is NVIDIA. And in case you missed it, down 7% uh, in the after hour session here. It delivered the company, at least when you look at the narrative here, uh, underwhelmed as far as forecasts and details. So, the forecast also admitted that production snags here uh, with its highly anticipated Blackwell chip. Uh, we spoke with the CEO, Jensen Huang, exclusively a few hours back. Uh, he actually tried to ease some of these investor concerns. Have a listen. We made a mass change to improve the yield. Functionality of Blackwell is wonderful. We're sampling Blackwell all over the world today. Uh, we um, uh, show people, uh, uh, giving tours to people uh, of the Blackwell systems that we have up and running. Uh, you could find pictures of Blackwell systems um, all over the web. Uh, we have started volume production. Uh, volume production will ship in Q4. Q4, we will have billions of dollars of Blackwell revenues. And um, we will ramp from there. We will ramp from there. The demand for Blackwell far exceeds its supply, of course, in the beginning, uh, because the demand is so great. Uh, but we're going to have lots and lots of supply. And uh, we will be able to ramp uh, starting in Q4. We have billions of dollars of revenues, and we'll ramp from there into Q1, into Q2, and through next year. We're going to have a great next year as well. Jensen, what is the demand for accelerated computing beyond the hyperscalers and meta? Hyperscalers represent about 45% of our total data center business. We're relatively diversified today. We have hyperscalers. Uh, we have uh, internet service providers, we have uh, sovereign AIs, we have um, industries, enterprises, so it's fairly, fairly diversified. Uh, aside, outside of hyperscalers is the other 55%. Now, uh, the application use across all of that, all of that data center uh, starts with accelerated computing. Accelerated computing uh, does everything, of course, from, uh, well, the, the, the models, the, the things that we know about, which is generative AI, and that gets most of the attention. Um, but at the core, we also do uh, database processing, pre- and post-processing of, 
of, uh, of data before you uh, use it for generative AI. Um, transcoding, scientific simulations, computer graphics, of course, image processing, of course. And so there's tons of applications that people use our uh, accelerated computing for, and one of them is uh, generative AI. There we go. We were trying to figure that out. It was a black jacket. I'm not sure it was leather, though. That was not leather. It didn't seem like it was no, leather, right? No, that was not leather. So okay. Maybe that's is, why the that a sign? Down. I don't know. <laughs> we should ask Ed Ludlow, of course. That was him, of course, with the, with the NVIDIA boss earlier, uh, earlier on. Okay. See, there are too many... Too many storylines to this NVIDIA story. Uh, Tommy Fang is here with us on set, head of China Global Markets at, at UBS. Tommy, nice to see you. Good morning. We're down on the CSI 300. Your colleague, Wang Tao, and the team downgraded the growth, their growth forecasts for China 4.6%. The read-through in markets is if China's no longer growing at, call it 7%, earnings growth suffers. Hence, the market is where it is. How, how do we... You know, how do we come up with a strategy when China's growing at 4 4.5% .5 only? Well, David and Steve, great to be here. Right. Um, uh, yeah, so it was not planned, right? So, so my <laughs> colleagues uh, released that. But, but I think the downward trend for the macro uh, environment is, mm. is quite obvious. Mm. So yeah. for equity investor, what we look at it is the, really the expectation versus reality. Mm. So I think overall uh, economic growth is a little bit touched below the expectation, so uh, to say the least. And the second is relative performance, right? right. So in many ways, uh, China versus the, the rest of the world, the US, um, Japan, India, and, and all that. And the last but not least is really on to the corporate earnings, uh, yep. how the policies. So overall, I would give China probably B minus, C plus uh, year to day. You know, it's not a knockout performance to say the least, but uh, you know, there's some positive uh, within there. Well, again, I've been pouring through the, your downgrade or your, your team's downgrade. Uh, obviously, the ongoing and lack of clarity and lack of success on some of these piecemeal property measures have not necessarily propped up the growth trajectory. And one of the lines I saw that uh, UBSC's downside risks, further downside risks, to that 4.6, which is lower than the consensus estimate for growth this year, because there's persistent deflation, obviously, and that makes it much harder for companies to pay down their debt. So how does that translate to that, obviously, profitability and their viability going forward, and how long does this last? Uh, there's some silver lining. Uh, first and foremost, we have been pounding the table uh, to Beijing and the policymaker over the past 18 months. So you have to stimulate, and then you have to stimulate fast. So it, it's like all-in strategy, because when you... When certain things um, facing a sort of a trend movement or downward uh, press pressure, so when you push it up at the initial stage, the force is limited. But when when they have its acceleration force by itself, the you know the counter force would need to be a lot harder in terms of policies and all that. So so that's number one. But on the other side, the positive side for equity investors is really hopefully the return on earning or the profitability for the winners will grow because. When you have a high growth um, economies, so there's just hyper competition, right? There's a lot of, it, and then the barrier to entry is, li, uh, is lower in, in China. Mm -hmm. So therefore, everybody is compete with a much lower profitability scenario. When the growth is sub, say, 5%, it's, it's a decent, but, but not as high as 7 or whatever uh, yeah. you, you mentioned. So then you weed out the, the, the mediocres, mm -hmm. and hopefully, the better performers and will return to the equity investors. I, I also want to get your thoughts on, since we're talking earnings, like buybacks have come up as, yes. a, you know, as a viable alternative yep. for, of use of cash for, 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 for companies. Do you think buying companies that are buying back their stock, is that a viable investment strategy? Again, I think it's, it's case by case. Uh, right. We're being, you know, being an investment bank, we're being on the pitch to many of those uh, uh, companies doing well. So whether it's buyback, whether it's uh, dividend payout, which, you know, insurance companies uh, loved it. But ultimately, you just need to get the earning and the profitability up. 
and then hopefully return to the investors. Hmm. What's really your outlook for the A-share markets? They've been obviously extremely subdued. And, and in that trend, you've also seen southbound connect to Hong Kong increase in the most recent quarter. So it looks as though investors who have very few avenues to get returns on their money in this down economy in China are looking abroad. They're coming down south to Hong Kong. Uh, when, when are you going to see the catalyst to get the A-shares going in Shanghai and Shenzhen? And you're having a conference coming yes, up yes. right now in Shenzhen to talk about this. Yes, yes. So, so we're having this uh, uh, next Monday uh, mm-hmm. in Shenzhen. We have, by the way, a record sign-up in terms of the investors and uh, A-share corporates um, and also CIOs. So, so that reflects people still care about China. They wanted to uh, find the winners. Um, but I think, Steve, to answer your question, it's not, it's not easy, right? So we have to look at the fundamentals. But at the same time, really, uh, hopefully the policy will come in and uh, to really uh, stimulate the economy. What are the best tactical opportunities right now in the Asia market? Sure. I, I think the high dividend um, and also the buyback company uh, okay. is, is one. Uh, obviously, China continue to be uh, greener, wealthier, and healthier. So those are the sectors uh, which have uh, obviously uh, very strong uh, potential to grow. But but we really have to look at the company uh, specific. Okay. So that's why I think what our company, uh, our conference is for, right, with uh, more than 111 uh, listed company. Right. They're all keen to come to our conference to talk to the global investor to tell them their stories. Okay. Is it, uh, and I'm wondering whether, uh, to your point, it's a stock picker's market. You know, maybe you pick the one or two of the best in a in a certain segment as well. Are you concerned over margins, for example, and this and this price war? Um, I think you know one thing uh, drives this um, sort of a lack of confidence is uh, in our own quote unquote de- deflation. Yeah. So when price coming off along with a weaker um, demand, mm. so that drives the the profitability, right? But at the mm. same time, as, uh, to Steve's point. Um, we have seen a positive sign of m and and the weaker um, um, players exiting different industry and the markets. Right. So, so for us to protect a healthy profitability for corporates and then to really have that local hero, whether it's uh, state-owned or private sector, is, is the key, right? So we need to have uh, the video of the war for China, and we had those uh, before, and then we definitely need more of those to lead the equity market. Well. Tommy, have a, have a great conference, and we'll, we'll you. see you again next time you're, you're back here in town. Tommy Fang, their head of China Global Markets there at, at UBS. Right, a, a very quick weather update. Steve, you might know more about this, of course, this massive typhoon that's literally made landfall in, in Japan earlier on. Yeah. So, uh, they've downgraded the emergency warning issued for Kagoshima, but that being said, of course, I think it was the highest that they've ever issued it was. in a certain prefecture in the right. southern island there. It, it's expected to slow down a little bit as it goes over land, but it's really, if you see the the trajectory of Shanshan. It is going right up through Kyushu, Shikoku, and then Honshu. And it's disrupting, obviously, flights, uh, rail services. It's disrupting car autom- uh, plants. I think uh, Honda has a, a factory in Kyushu and Kumamoto, which right. is uh, a big silicon, the old Silicon Island, and now is being revitalized with a TSMC plant. Nissan, two plants in Kyushu also being closed. Toyota Motor uh, suspending operations at 14 plants. They're based in Nagoya on Honshu. Uh, so this storm is going to go right up the archipelago. Uh, it, it's, you know, it goes from west to east, and that's well, sort of southwest to northeast. Yeah. It's going to follow the chain of islands, so we have to watch this closely. Absolutely. There we go. Live pictures out of Tokyo, and of course, not to mention hundreds of flights have also been cancelled um, as a precaution, of course, given, given the weather there. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, who bought Meituan yesterday? Beers on you, right? Uh, We're up 9.5%. We were down 3.2% yesterday, so there might be uh, some people there who were itching to buy that dip, past tense, and glad that you did if you did. Uh, We're up about 9.5% right now, 112. We closed at 102, uh, and then we had the company earnings, and then you had the buyback, of course, on your screens. There we go. Quite a nice pop there in shares of Meituan. And just in case you're curious... Some of the chip makers, too, on your screens. Anyway, um, yeah, I think we're talking geopolitics now. 
Yeah, too bad we can't have a delivery here this morning, but too no. early for beers, right, Dave? All right. Um, no. <laughs> no, no too, early. too early. Well, changing gears, obviously. Yeah. China and the U.S. say President Xi Jinping and Joe Biden, they're going to talk in the coming weeks. It follows the trip to Beijing by U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan as tensions simmer over a range of trade and geopolitical concerns. Obviously, China correspondent Min Min Lo joins us now here in the studio. So what's the big takeaway? The fact that they're talking is progress? Well, yes. Well, look, President Biden is the only president since Jimmy Carter who hasn't visited Beijing during his time in office. Obviously, the pandemic was uh, part of that as well. Uh, so the two sides now setting up uh, a potential talks for them. We don't know if it will be in Beijing. If they, he doesn't travel to Beijing, there are still a couple of opportunities in Brazil during the G20 summit or in Peru during the APEC summit. And remember the last time when they met at the sidelines of the APEC summit in San Francisco, you were there, Steve. It was an extremely consequential meeting that until now you keep hearing the Chinese foreign ministry referring back to that meeting, the, the meeting where both sides really pledged to stabilize relations after that spy balloon incident. Another very key outcome uh, from this meeting is the fact that the two countries have now agreed to deepen military to military dialogue down to the theater command level. And this is a direct line of communication that Washington has been pushing for for a long time since Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. And it's seen as very critical to avert any sort of accidental crisis that could brew up in the Taiwan Strait or the South China Sea. Okay, uh, let's turn to, to climate because that's really one area where there's probably the best over or the biggest overlap between the two. I think John Podesta is headed to Beijing next week. Yes, so that is one of the outcomes of the marathon talks over the last two days. Mm -hmm. uh, the two sides agreed to cooperate on climate change and also artificial intelligence um, and anti-narcotic enf enforcement as well. So Podesta mm -hmm. going to visit Beijing sometime in the first week of September. The goal here is for the two sides to discuss how to reduce a range of greenhouse gas emissions beyond mm -hmm. just carbon dioxide. Uh, and they are also set to uh, make new pledges by 2035. And again, Beijing uh, is under pressure to do a little bit more given that it's the largest greenhouse gas emitter. And also given the timing here just ahead of the U.S. election. So, you know, a lot of uncertainty about what President Trump would do if he wins office. So the two sides also looking to foster connections of non-state, non-governmental institutions so that the cooperation can sustain beyond a change in administration. I just wanted to add, too, I've met Liu Jinmin, the new China envoy and he has a very affable very friendly demeanor which can very much help uh, in these uh, repairing of relations with someone like Wang Yi much more stern presence yeah. uh, you know on the geopolitical level with Jake Sullivan but Liu Jianmin is a very affable friendly individual so that could really help build relations yeah hopefully it would last beyond the transition of the US administration in okay. November Min Min, thank you so much. Min Min Lo, there, China correspondent there, uh, with what happened and, of course, what to watch next week with that visit coming through uh, at the Capitol. Pl plenty more ahead, and, man, oh, man, are we seeing some massive moves in these markets right now. More on that in a moment. And welcome back. You're watching, of course, The China Show. Here are some of the big corporate stories we are following today. Berkshire Hathaway has become the first U.S. firm outside the tech sector to top $1 trillion in market value. Little Warren Buffett's conglomerate has rallied this year on strong insurance results, outperforming being the S&P 500 with a 30% gain. Berkshire joins an exclusive club dominated by tech giants, including Alphabet, Meta, Platforms, and, of course, that little company known as NVIDIA. Shares of Salesforce, they jumped in extended trading after the company reported a strong profit outlook. The maker of customer management software sees profit exceeding $10 per share for the fiscal year. That tops estimates. Salesforce also announcing that CFO Amy Weaver will step down from her position once a successor is chosen. And HP slipped in extended trading after cutting its full-year profit outlook on a continued downturn in its printer unit. Printer supply revenue is seen as HP's leading profit driver. The disappointing forecast eclipsed a first revenue gain in two years, suggesting an end to a long slump in demand for personal computers. Dave? Yeah, let's. Well, HP was on four and a half percent. Nothing quite some of these moves we're seeing in double digits, you say. Okay, so let's start things off with. Why don't we go to Lee Auto first? Uh, and some of the earnings coming through, they're also disappointing. So we're down 13% uh, on shares of Lee Auto. BYD Electronic, 
as opposed, of course, to the other BYD, but of course related there. 14% drop. That's also uh, an earnings-related uh, story. First half net income also missing estimates as far as BYD Electronic is concerned. Third one on your board is a textile manufacturer, Shenzhou International, also disappointing as far as the, the revenue growth was concerned. Net income, though, coming in above estimates. So that seems to be more the to a top-line concern. And Meituan is a, well, that's an earnings story. And within that earnings story, of course, it's also that buyback story, 8.5%, coming off highs a little bit. But certainly, you do see that there are bright spots amidst what is really mostly a sea of red. Okay, um, the, uh, just to pivot here, ask classes and look at some of the... And by the way, when this next one's coming up, just keep in mind, we, we, did, we are coming off a, a decent, what, two, three-day rally in some of these metals. Uh, and as you can see, weighing quite heavily right now. We're down 1.4%. That's your musical genre today, Steve. Yeah. Heavy metal. Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden. Um, Is that your pick? Uh, Black Sabbath, actually. Black Sabbath. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Yeah, we have to go all the way back there. Party on, Garth. Metallica, go Guns N' Roses. <laughs> um, anyway, use your illusions three when you look at these markets. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. I'm not concerned. I think if you look at NVIDIA, they still control this market and will continue to, to I would say, dominate this space over the next three to five years. Um, you know, they own over 95% of this market today. Delivering uh, chips at this rate, at this scale, is fantastic and unprecedented. I, I don't think there's much of a revenue issue here, of a growth issue here. I think the little bit of a pushback is probably more around the margin situation. That type of growth isn't necessarily realistic or sustainable in the long term. Two, it's not necessary in the long term either. But three, there are also supply constraints, right? And so NVIDIA can only grow as quickly as, as its supply allows it to. At the end of the day, we still sense enormous and urgent demand across the board. And that really mitigates, in our view, the risk of a pause uh, in shipments uh, as customers wait for the next generation of chips to be available in volumes. Yep, I guarantee you that's, that's simply a partial list of all the commentary on the world's m most watched set of earnings which came through out of NVIDIA a couple of hours back. Shares, as you can see, closed in the after-hours session. Your starting point, of course, going into the session in the U.S. today, 117 a pop. Welcome back to the show. You're watching The China Show. In fact, we're still feeling the NVIDIA effect here. TSMC, Samsung Electronics, and some of these other chip-related stocks uh, on your screens. They're feeling the pinch from uh, what really took place, and it's just not NVIDIA, right? You look at the likes of ARM, AMD, all also fell in the after hour session here. Uh, Asia, outside of China, outside of this, if that's even possible to sort of disentangle the pull up we're getting from chips, we're down about six tenths and one percent. Uh, the additional leg down is from uh, the Hong Kong Open, and you're getting the likes of things like Li Auto, for example, and some of the other big constituents on the HSI, uh, pulling the index down even further. Nick is off four tenths of one percent. We'll get you guys an update on the weather and the typhoon that's hitting Japan as we speak. Taiwan, of course, feeling the drag out of TSMC. Nothing much to tell you about apart from, yeah, I mean, the NVIDIA story so far has trumped all things macro, which is in itself, of course, also a, a macro story. Now, we spoke exclusively with, with the boss uh, at NVIDIA, uh, Jensen Huang, of course, and he told us he's optimistic about the outlook for next year. We're going to have lots and lots of supply, and uh, we will be able to ramp uh, starting in Q4, we have billions of dollars of revenues, and we'll ramp from there into Q1, into Q2, and through next year. We're going to have a great next year as well. Let's bring in the team, Mark Cranfield in Singapore for us, and also Robert Lee here in set, senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Mark, I'll start with you. Mark, the curse of being a public company. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just like, and not just a public company, but as uh, Kriti Gupta was saying yesterday, an A-star public company. So when an A-star student only produces an A paper, you know, people get disappointed. And that's, that's the trouble. It's, it's all about expectations and maybe unrealistic expectations. You've had a company which has produced incredible results for quarter after quarter. The numbers themselves are probably still amazing, and I'm sure Robert will enlighten us on exactly what that all means. But it's all about relativity and whether this 
compared to where people were looking, maybe it's not quite good enough. It's, it makes you wonder whether or not NVIDIA is on the verge of becoming Apple. For years and years, Apple beat forecasts, beat expectations, had a fantastic outperformance in the market. And then eventually, it just became an ordinary big cap stock. Maybe NVIDIA is on the verge of right. becoming that. Very profitable, but just somebody who slips into the general format of the market and he's no longer the superstar that people got used to. Well, Mark, you know, someone told me uh, the definition of NVIDIA is someone who didn't get into the NVIDIA craze. I mean, is this stock still going to propel the S&P 500 through what some say could be a soft landing if the Fed starts lowering rates? Or is this tech sector in the Magnificent Seven still going to propel things? I suspect that we're about to go into a period that could be tricky for, for U.S. equities and for global equities. We're coming into Labor Day weekend. Often it's a period when people reassess what they think about their outlook for markets between then and the end of the year. This year is a bit special because you've got the U.S. elections, you've got some geopolitical things going on in the background, and markets are already pretty fully priced as well. It wouldn't be a huge surprise if people come back from Labor Day and think, well, the outlook is not as perfect as we previously thought and start getting a bit defensive. If people start getting defensive, that only means one thing for equities. It means they're going to grind a bit lower, probably go a bit defensive into treasuries and you get maybe a bit of a move into the US dollar as well. It's hard to see how people come out of this period thinking that the Fed is doing enough to achieve all it can do with just a 25 basis points cut. They, they could well seem to be behind the curve already to some investors. And the push for 50 basis points is going to get greater and greater, especially if the employment data next week is not perfect. Uh, Robert, I'll bring you in. Your, your, your thoughts on these, these results. Yeah, I just want to say very briefly, uh, Mark has stolen some of my thunder there, but I completely agree with everything he's just said. <laughs> again, I think the fundamental outlook for NVIDIA and the AI sector in the near term is, again, it's supply constrained during effective monopoly. You know, where things go into next year with questions about monetization with their uh, hyperscale customers is another thing. Um, but, you know, the reaction we've seen in the market, again, when a, sorry, this old cliched statement, when a stock's priced to perfection, when there's such high expectations built in, you know, and, and trading on punchy valuations, you know, the risk is to the downside. So I think of three brief things in brief, the scale of the beat is diminishing. Um, so I think that's been widely reported. Um, also, the growth, you know, it's still pretty stellar growth, but the rate of growth is slowing. The top line growth for this quarter was 122%, and that's great, isn't it? Mm. But last quarter, the quarter before, they did 262, and the quarter before that, they did 265. Looking forward into the coming quarter, the, the growth will slow to 76. So that's still a great number, but it's a significant slowdown in where they were. It's growth, Jim, but not as we knew it, I think is the best thing to say. Well, oh, Robert, yeah. uh, what about Blackwell? Is it going to be the cash cow that Jensen Huang says it's going to be, regardless of whether China is going to get its hands on it? Um, yes, uh, this will help them um, extend the market leadership, I mean, which is already significant. It's a major product driver for next year. But I just want to stress there still is residual execution risk on that because they're sampling to customers at the moment. It goes into volume production from the end of this year. These things are non-trivial. Again, you're working at the cutting edge of physics. A few atoms out here or there can, can create an, an issue. So whilst there's been production delays, which they seem to have overcome in the near term, I do want to you know, wholeheartedly stress there is still residual risk on Blackwell because it's such a complex product. So I'm in no way saying there will be problems, but there is a significant residual risk that could impact their rollout into next year. And Robert, you, you brought up something interesting. So would you agree that the problem now still is a supply chain issue more than competition? Uh, no, no. They, yeah, absolutely. I completely agree on that. Um, they've got, um, you know, the demand is not an issue whatsoever. These companies are fighting over themselves to uh, uh, clamoring for chips. So the view on the demand side through into early next year looks good. Okay, uh, oh. and just quickly on that too. So, if when do we start worrying about competition? When does competition trump supply chain? And when does he said effective monopoly? When does antitrust become an issue here? Oh, antitrust, that's an interesting one. Um, I'll skirt that question for a moment. Um, I mean, there are a number of interesting startups coming with some very innovative technology. Um, they're nowhere near going into production, so I don't think that's a near term risk. 
the company that is, you know, arguably um, chasing at the heels at the moment is someone like AND. But again, if Blackwell ex is executed properly, then that will enable NVIDIA to extend its lead. The issue, though, is usage and monetization in the customers. I think that's the key issue. Steve, I think you have a question for Mark. Well, I was just going to give Mark the opportunity since obviously Robert agreed with everything Mark said prior. Anything that he said, could you hear him? Did you agree with him or is there anything you want to pick yeah, apart? I mean, <laughs> yeah, apologies for, for taking some of Robert's thunder, but great to be on the same page for a change. That's really nice. Um, I think that the big <laughs> issue for markets in the, in the short term will be the, the rotation effect. There's surely going to be some spinning out of NVIDIA and maybe some of the other AI stories into other parts of the market. And it's whether or not that is a positive move or whether the outflows from some of these AI names is too overwhelming and the market just can't handle it. So next week we're probably going to see some, some decent rotation. Let's see whether it works out well or not, considering that the Fed is in the background and they're going to do something. But is it enough? Is it this time that the market finally decides They've been waiting too long, and if they don't get 50 basis points, they're just going to take it badly. Team, thank you so much. Fantastic insights and banter. All right, Mark Cranfield in Singapore for us. Robert Lee here on set. Uh, just very, very quickly, of course, where, where are we on NVIDIA? Just to take stock here, right? Very, very simply, would you buy NVIDIA at these multiples? 30 times earnings. We're using the after-hour session, 117 a pop. And of course, you extrapolate that. Do we have the graphic that shows us that? So, 30 and a half is the price to uh, and price to earnings, forward earnings. I'm going to talk about earnings. It's adjusted EPS, fiscal 2016. Guys, do we have that? Can we show that, please? It's coming. I heard. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, from 38 times, would you buy it now at 30 times earnings when you look at the current uh, share price? That's number one. Number two is if it's not Nvidia that floats your boat anymore. The question that our MLive team has floated for our viewers is what could take NVIDIA's place as the equity market driver? So chime in, of course, on both those things. You know where to find us, of course. Right, coming up here in the, uh, the man of the hour himself, Jensen Huang, without the leather jacket, I should note, his thoughts on sovereign AI coming up next. And uh, also, we'll look at whether Meituan can continue to support gains through the rest of the year despite weak consumer sentiment in China. That is next. Yep. And, of course, an update here on the typhoon over in Japan. We're now getting uh, some numbers coming through. Three casualties, one missing from typhoon Shan Shan. An update, too, on where we are on the story just ahead. This is Bloomberg. One stock we're tracking very closely, and the price action alone tells you why. Uh, Meituan out with earnings, out with the buyback, uh, up 9% uh, in the first 42 minutes uh, of trade. Let's unpack the earnings story with our uh, Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst, Catherine Lim, joining us now out of Singapore. Uh, yeah, Catherine, the, did the company deliver the best set of results that uh, we could have imagined? Well, do you know what? At least the revenue beat at for even though it was just a small 1.3 percent, but really I think it is the guidance um, as we look out into the rest of the year. Um, you know, as we talk about the weak consumer sentiment in China, this is a company that's telling you that they've got the services. You know, they've got um, you know products for some of the very value conscious um, customers on the mainland that can actually help them drive, um, you know, better spending on their platforms. So it is the guidance out there that's really driving, um, you know, the optimism that we're seeing in the stock today. Well, Kat, the company also announcing a billion dollar, one billion dollar share buyback last night too. Seems, dare I say, a little small. I, I would never want to say a billion dollars is so small, but compared to Alibaba and JD, how would you um, assess this buyback compared to the others? I hear I hear you, Stephen. Well, you know, you're talking about like, you know, Alibaba who buys like 5.8 billion US dollars, you know, quarter and JD.com, they've announced that, you know, they've got a new 5 billion planned, um, you know, in the pipeline. So 1 billion, um, you know, it doesn't look big. And in the scheme of things itself, you know, as we continue to roll into, you know, the end of the year, I don't refute the possibility that Meituan's going to complete this, like, you know, by December, and they can actually announce more. 
more. Really, I think, you know, the company where they are right now, um, you know, they've not spoken anything about their overseas expansion plan, Kita, for that mention. So, um, you know, um, that's something that we need to actually watch out for and see whether there is use for the funds as they go into markets outside of Hong Kong, like Mid Middle East, which they've talked about in the past, but we're still waiting for updates from that. All right, Catherine Lim, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst. Thanks for joining us. Well, here are some of the other stories we're following this morning on The China Show. HP slipped in extended trading after cutting its full year profit outlook on a continued downturn in its printer unit. Printer supply revenue is seen as HP's leading profit driver. The disappointing forecast, though, eclipsed a first revenue gain in two years. That suggests an end to a long slump in demand for personal computers. Well, French prosecutors have charged Telegram CEO Pavel Durov with complicity in criminal use of the app, including for drug trafficking and sharing images allegedly of child sexual abuse. They say Telegram also refused to help run wiretaps on criminal suspects. The billionaire has been ordered to post 5 million euros bail and banned from leaving France. Telegram didn't immediately respond to a request for comment on those charges. Just ahead here on the China show, Typhoon Shanshan making landfall in Japan. You're looking at live pictures of Kagoshima there. So forcing the weather agency to issue an emergency warning, although that uh, has been downgraded a notch in the last hour or so. The latest in a couple of minutes. This is Bloomberg. And welcome back. You're watching The China Show here on Bloomberg. The head of the world's largest vaccine maker says governments need to invest early in health to protect their economies as well as their people. Serum Institute of India CEO Adar Punawala spoke to our colleague Haslinda Amin for the latest edition of Latitude. And here's a preview. I think a healthier population is always going to be a more productive Population. And that's good for the economy. It's good for everything. I think it's common sense. It's just that sometimes the political will isn't there in some of these countries uh, to prioritize. They want to do it, but, you know, they have these other priorities. So I hope that they can keep this as a priority because a workforce that is, you know, 20 or 30 percent down during a pandemic or an outbreak or uh, is suffering from endemic disease in certain areas, there are certain diseases that, you know, keep spreading, is not healthy, it's not productive. And, you know, um, if you want everyone to perform at their best and you want health care costs to be down, you don't want to be burdened with insurance costs and other costs. I think it's important to invest early in health, in child health, in women's health. And I hope that continues both in India and other parts. We know COVID took the world by surprise and some say disease X is coming sooner than you expect. Is there a sense when disease X might hit the world? No, I'm, I'm not losing sleep over which day and when it's going to come out, but um, we're definitely prepared. Uh, you know, we have a huge testing infrastructure in India, for example. We can detect now, you know, new diseases that can come about. And if they're spreading, then, you know, we can take action. We've got uh, a huge vaccine and pharmaceutical industry in India. So India is very well, I think, poised. But when the crisis comes, we stick to what we've committed. I think that's important. Um, so let's see what happens. Okay, if you're itching to see more, you can catch the full episodes um, of Latitude with Haslinda, of course, premiering today on Bloomberg Television at those times on your screens, 8 p.m. if you're watching out of Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Beijing. There we go. Okay, um, you can catch it also on YouTube um, anytime. All right, um, from that, let's uh, just t get you guys an update of the typhoon situation in Japan, and quite a rare one, too, in terms of the strength. And when you look at the path of this, it's looking like it's going to barrel across the country here, Steve. Yeah, it's going to barrel up the entire uh, production uh, hinterland, if you will, of Japan. Yeah. Uh, Toyota is going to be closing at, or has closed 14 of its factories in and around Nagoya, a couple of factories from Nissan, another one from Honda 
Honda down in Kyushu being closed. This is considered a rare typhoon, according to the Japan Meteorological Agency. They did issue last night the highest emergency warning for Kagoshima Prefecture. I believe they've downgraded that, but still, this is a powerful storm that, according to Bloomberg, they use this size and scope. It is moving at a pace of a bicycle. It's really slow mm -hmm. and bringing tons of rain. Thousand milliliters of rain expected or uh, exceeding uh, that. And again, two, 240,000 buildings across seven prefectures wow. in Kyushu have lost power. So it is a tough one. Let's, well, let's, let's get a sense of how things are on the ground uh, in Tokyo. Gareth Allen, our breaking news editor, is in fact with us um, out of our Tokyo studios. G Gareth, how's the weather outside? <laughs> Yeah, it's, fi it's fine in Tokyo for the moment, um, although there are, there are forecasts that, um, you know, even, even quite a long way away from Kyushu, um, there's been some rain um, throughout the country, so quite heavy rain in areas around Nagoya and Mie Prefecture and sort of in the western region of Japan, and they're expecting that later this evening Tokyo could be affected as well. Um, so we're, uh, we're watching out for, uh, for uh, any impact of that. The typhoon made landfall this morning uh, in Kagoshima Prefecture at about 8am. Uh, it was still uh, what was what's categorised as a very strong typhoon at that point, and as it has made landfall now, it's, like it's been uh, slightly weakened. It's now categorised as a strong uh, typhoon, but the authorities are still saying it's a it's a formidable storm uh, that you know to still be at this strength while it has made landfall and is it very 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 slowly crawling across Kyushu at the moment um, and heading uh, towards Shikoku, probably reach there by uh, by tomorrow. Gareth, Steve Angle here. Uh, what kind of economic impact are we talking about here? They usually are, are short-term events, obviously, but this is a slow-moving uh, storm, so it's going to go right up the island chain there, as you just said. Shikoku then is going to hit Honshu. It's going to hit production bases of Japan. That's right. I mean, Kyushu itself is, is, is a very major manufacturing center in Japan. Um, and as you said before, Honda, uh, Nissan yesterday said that they suspend, they've suspended operations for today and tomorrow. Toyota has actually suspended its operations, not only in Kyushu, but across the entire country. And they said they'll be suspended to midday today. Um, we're expecting a, a decision from them over whether they're going to resume operations at this point probably looking relatively unlikely given the situation in Kyushu right now. Um, other impacts include, as you said, there's about a quarter of a million uh, households without power in Kyushu at the moment. Uh, transport links have been hit. Both the big airlines, uh, JAL and ANA, have cancelled uh, more than 400 flights today. Uh, there'll be more tomorrow. Rail's been hit. Transport's been hit. Deliveries aren't being made at the moment. Um, so yeah, the, um, the impact from this is going to be quite, quite, quite major. It is, of course, a, 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 sh a relatively short period of time. It's only going to be a couple of days of, of lost production. But um, you know, given the problem Japan's automakers, automakers have already had um, this year with, um, with production suspensions, you know, this ongoing impact is certainly uh, going to be felt. Gareth, thank you so much. Gareth Allen there with the latest, our breaking news editor in Tokyo for us. Right, and some of these, uh, some of the related stocks, of course, and we're just flashing bottom of your screens, the latest here out of uh, Japan Airlines in terms of the number of flights that have been, that have been canceled here. Uh, can we get the number back, please, so I can just read it so and our viewers can see it? Can we, the, the, the graphic right before this at the bottom of your, the, the L3, please. Thank you so much. 275 domestic flights uh, on Thursday. Japan Airlines on your screens going into the Tokyo lunch break. And also, of course, uh, the, 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 the Shinkansen, of course, what? the bullet train, what? also seeing what? some... Uh, so, uh, some disruptions there. Uh, the announcement came in uh, early, early this morning. Okay, from that, uh, J.R. West, thank you so much. The, uh, we're looking at some of the entertainment-related stocks over in Korea, um, and at the center of this is SM Entertainment. So two things here. Uh, there's a downgrade out of Morgan Stanley, and there's, a, well, reports of sexual offense allegations involving one of the artists of SM Entertainment can't say that's, unfortunately, I can't say that's a, that, that's, that's, that, that, that's a new thing as well. Uh, we'll continue to track this story, of course, and as you can see, the markets are reacting uh, to that too. Okay, um, speaking of airlines and back, uh, back to airlines here. So Qantas was out with earnings earlier on Air New Zealand too, and coming up on deck today's Air China and China Southern are set to report uh, earnings uh, later today, as you can see, not a lot of uh, not a lot uh, of earnings coming through. Oh, we just showed ANA, haven't we? Where's, is Air China in there? Can we get Air China in, please, so we can see that? To so Air China, China Southern. Anyway, we'll we'll show that to you later. I promise. In fact, now speaking of Qantas, we will be speaking with the boss at Qantas. At the, well, he's not the the rival 
um, Air New Zealand. So Greg Warren joins us on Bloomberg Markets Asia on those times on your screen later uh, in the next hour. And still ahead, we're looking at education for senior citizens in China. Online learning services provider Quanta Singh is banking on the market for growth. We'll be speaking with its CFO in a few minutes. This is Bloomberg. Japanese markets going into the lunch break and in uh, as we were just talking in, in the last segment the skies are still relatively quiet and the weather seems to be still clear but uh, we are expecting of course the the typhoon that is currently in the country's south to start making itself felt uh, there in the capital as far as disruptions go to um, uh, to things like transport we are already seeing that in fact in terms of some preemptive measures um, speaking of preemptive you probably saw chip stocks on your screen that show that again, please, going into uh, the session today. Uh, certainly an area of focus given the earnings out of NVIDIA. Right. Um, speaking of NVIDIA, earlier on on the China show, we spoke with an analyst from IDC. NVIDIA also admitting, of course, some of the project production snags there uh, around its Blackwell chips. Well, we spoke with IDC and they're not worried. Have a look. They're expanding their compute capability, and that means a lot more silicon in each system for them that they can continue to, to prosper and mine and grow, right? So I think the next wave for them is going to continue to be growing in the networking infrastructure space because that is also prime for, for change with, with AI coming into that domain. And if you look closely at their numbers, the networking business for NVIDIA is growing quite strong, over 100%, while most of the rest of the industry is, is at flat to down because of elevated inventory. Uh, Mario Morales of IDC. Now in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg Technologies, CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen Huang, told us that the government deals driving so-called sovereign AI. Not necessarily. Uh, sometimes it it's, uh, deals with um, uh, particular uh, regional service provider that's been funded by the government. And oftentimes that's the case. In the case of in the case of Japan, for example, the the Japanese uh, government came out and uh, offered um, uh, subsidies of a uh, couple billion dollars, I think, uh, for several different uh, internet companies and telcos to be able to fund their AI infrastructure. Uh, India has a, a sovereign AI initiative going, and they're uh, building their AI infrastructure. Uh, Canada, uh, the UK, France, Italy, um, I'm missing somebody. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, you know, a large number of countries are subsidizing their regional data centers so that they could become able to uh, build out their AI infrastructure. They recognize that their country's uh, knowledge, their country's data, digital data, is also their natural resource. No, not just the land they're sitting on, not just the air above them, uh, but they, they realize now that their, their digital knowledge is part of their natural and national resource. And they ought to harvest that and process that and transform it into their national digital yes. intelligence. And so this is a this is what we call sovereign AI. You could imagine almost every single country in the world uh, will uh, e eventually recognize this and build out their AI infrastructure. Jensen, you, you use the word resource, and that makes me think about the energy requirements here. I think on the call, you, did, you talked about how the next generation models will have many orders of magnitude greater compute needs. But how will the energy needs increase, and what is the advantage you feel NVIDIA has um, in, in that sense? Well, the most important thing that we do is increase the performance of and increase the performance and efficiency of our next generation. So Blackwell is many times more performant than Hopper at the same level of power used. And so that's energy efficiency, more performance with the same amount of power or same performance at a lower power. And that's number one. And uh, the second is using uh, Luca cooling. We support, air, we support air cooling, we support liquid cooling, but liquid cooling is a lot more energy efficient. And so 
So the combination of that, all of that, you're going to get a pretty large, uh, pretty large step up. And that was Jensen Huang, the, the boss, of course, at NVIDIA with, of course, our Ed Ludlow, that exclusive conversation uh, earlier uh, a few hours back here on Bloomberg Television. Right, so just ahead, uh, we'll be speaking with learning services provider Qantas Singh about their latest earnings and the, their outlook uh, and what they're seeing and the opportunities as they address China's silver, quote-unquote, economy. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. You're looking at the stock of China online, an online learning services provider, Qantas Singh. Uh, listed in the U.S., uh, the company reported earnings very recently. It's now, in fact, become profitable for the full year, net profit of $53 million. Now, of course, it is, as we mentioned, listed on the NASDAQ. So in case you are not too familiar with the company, the company offers financial literacy, personal interest courses, learning effectively for adults and addresses also the uh, the silver economy and i guess just to highlight to the other side of the coin of this demographic challenge in china right over 1.2 billion people are over the age of 15 so all you have to do in your head is fast forward 30 years and imagine how inverted this gets that being said that is also an opportunity for companies like quanta sing Joining us exclusively is the CFO, Tim Xie, joining us out of Beijing today. Tim, good morning, and thanks for, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, you guys recently reported, uh, reported the profits, um, and I'm wondering whether you think the company can remain profitable from here on. Yeah, thank you for having me, and good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Quantasync is a lifestyle a solution provider. We are catering the demand for the adults in China currently and mainly focusing on the middle and elderly people. Uh, so for our business, we commenced our operation since July nine, uh, 2019 and over the past five years we have accumulated uh, over one, uh, one point, uh, 1.28 uh, billion uh, 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 sorry, uh, 100, uh, 128 million registered users, and we have accumulated a sol solid infrastructure to serve such kind of population. So I think uh, during the past years of our operation, we accumulated both the experiences and the technological infrastructure to keep our operation uh, both profitable and efficient so that we can extend the lifetime value of our users to provide uh, valuable services and products for our uh, users to keep our platform grow and both uh, for our users and the platform. Tim, uh, Steve here, let me uh, think, ask you yeah. about the let me just ask you about the demographics behind your business, yeah. and that is the silver economy, the, the elderly. I, and I use that very loosely because I'm probably classified as elderly as well, because in China, the re official retirement age uh, for women is less than men. It's in the mid-50s, I think, and then 60 for men. Uh, I think they're talking about extending that. How, how much can this demographic of society in China contribute to the economy uh, at a time of a slowing economy? Yeah, I think uh, for the Chinese economy, I think at this stage, we are uh, reaching a high level of the development. So for each sector of the economy, we should, uh, we sh we should see that uh, based on a structural view. I think there are a lot of, uh, even though we have some difficulties and challenges, we have a lot of opportunities facing uh, each, our, uh, each of our companies and the economic uh, elements for our to develop and to uh, dive into. Uh, for I think for the for the silver economy because uh, especially for the people uh, who were born be, uh, after the 1960s, uh, there are many uh, maybe over 20 million uh, new uh, retiring people joining this demographic. I think for this kind of uh, population, we ha uh, we have 
they have experienced a very uh, high speed uh, economic growth and also uh, they enjoyed a very uh, high level of uh, living standard uh, so they have time and they have uh, they are well educated and they have the demand for both of the products and services for this uh, kind of population so for our company I think uh, we Starting our, we started our business uh, from the uh, interest-based online learning, uh, mainly for the adults, and uh, focusing on the middle-aged and elderly people. So this kind of population uh, will grow in the in the future, uh, in the future, and in the next couple of years. And that is our uh, mission and vision to serve this kind of population uh, better using our technology and our experiences to cater to their demand for their growth. Yeah, uh, Tim, you make a very good point because this is a, this is a growing market. Uh, but just to pick up on that, I'm looking yeah. at some of the figures. You mentioned 128 million total registered users. This is as of June. This is for your company. Yeah. I noticed, though, that of that 128 yeah. million, only 400,000 are actually paying customers. That's yeah. what, 0.00003%. And I'm wondering what the company's doing to increase that ratio of paying customers? Yeah, sure. I think that both means the uh, challenges we face and also the big opportunities in the, uh, in the time ahead. Uh, that's why we mm. just transformed our mission from just offering the lifetime learning to a, a holistic right. lifestyle solution provider recently. So because uh, in the past five years, I think we are still a young company. We, we are in our uh, early stage of the development, and we see the market opportunity to serve the uh, silver economy uh, demo uh, demographic. We have accumulated and we have invested a lot to acquire the uh, customers, mainly through the live streaming broadcasting and live streaming business model, uh, which uh, was developed by our uh, own company. So uh, during the past five years, we have accumulated the technology base and we have accumulated the large pool of users. Even though they, they are uh, registered with our platform and many of them have sent our uh, uh, live, live streaming, free live streaming courses. That means they have interest and they have demand for our right. services. And also we have uh, developed and we have cultivated a methodology and infrastructure to uh, serve this demand. But also we should, uh, in the future, we should enlarge the base to provide more tailor-made uh, both the products and services to cater to their demand to uh, make the paid users number grow in the future. So that's why we transformed our mission uh, from a purely online learning platform to the, to the holistic lifestyle solution provider for such kind of population. Tim, uh, given the demographics challenge in China, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that the, the government is pretty supportive of services uh, like you're providing. Premier Li Chang telling a state council session just Monday that China should draft targeted policies yeah. to help uh, with the aging population. On the flip side of that, we also saw in the last couple of years a crackdown on online education. Would you say that your business is pretty safe from that and that you do have government support? Yeah, sure. I think uh, I think the first is that we are doing the right thing because we uh, we see the market opportunity and we serve the market demand and based on our own uh, technology using our advantage and also uh, I think all of all those things we are doing is supported by the government policies, uh, especially for the silver economy because uh, I think we do the right thing and we are currently actually we are uh, cooperating with the local community uh, to serve the local uh, elderly people so that uh, is a very good uh, I think it's very uh, it's both good for the company and the community and the government will support uh, this kind of activities to help the, the uh, to help the society so that will benefit both the company and the community yeah Tim uh looking at just yeah. simply annual revenues you're you're about a half a billion US dollar company what would be your conservative estimate of annual revenues in five years? Uh, I think uh, because in the past we only 
uh, practice in the online learning area, especially for the for the adult learning. Uh, but you know, for adult learning, uh, this uh, very I think this some uh, some uh, we, we need to provide more services and products to serve the. Uh, adults, especially the senior people, uh, accept the purely learning. So I think in the future, I think uh, it definitely will grow our revenue based on the uh, customer's needs and demand. Uh, that is why we enlarge and we transform our uh, mission from just learning to the uh, lifestyle solution. So that's our aim to extend the uh, holistic uh, business model and the lifetime value of our uh, users. So that's why uh, we do that. And that's because we believe the revenue will grow based on our uh, products and services uh, delivered to our customers and users. Uh, I think in the, maybe in the next five years, we will grow maybe times of this, uh, of, uh, times of revenue uh, more than the existing uh, level. Tim, th Ting, th thank you so much for taking yeah. the time, and we'll, we'll, we'll see you here in, in Hong Kong at some point. All the best to the company, CFO yeah. at Quanta, Quanta Singh. If you're a Bloomberg subscriber, you can catch up with that interview in case you missed it and some of the others that took place earlier here on the shows. And, of course, the other one that we had earlier on was with Jensen Huang of NVIDIA. Catch the conversation. If you have any questions for our guests, you know how to reach us for a client. That's IB Go, of course. Check it out, TV Go. This is Bloomberg. And welcome back to the China Show. We're in the home stretch here of the two hour show. China and the U.S. say President Xi Jinping and Joe Biden will talk in the coming weeks. It follows the trip to Beijing by U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan as tensions simmer over a range of trade and geopolitical concerns. Our China correspondent, Min Min Lo, is now joining us here in Hong Kong. So, again, they're talking. It's good. Any fruitful outcomes? Yeah, well, I would say, actually, I want to draw your attention to the meeting today between Sullivan and the vice chair of the Central Military Commission, Zhang Youxia, because I think that is a big breakthrough. The last time that we saw such high-level military dialogue was in 2016, when Susan Rice was the national security aide. And look, last time when Lloyd Austin asked for you know high-level talks with the military, China has always fielded the defense minister, who is someone who has a diplomatic position but doesn't really have an influence, a meaningful influence over the military. So the fact that they sat down with the vice chair of the Central Military Commission, I think it's big. It's a, you know, going they've back... Had a they've had a change in the military hierarchy within the PLA as well. Li Shang Fu is no longer the top general. Yeah, it's Dong have... Jin now. Right. So yeah. has that offered a new platform, if you will, for dialogue? Yeah, I mean, the fact that they, they sat down, I guess it is almost like a return to president to, you know, the time of Barack Obama's time, you know, before the spy balloon incident, before the Nancy Pelosi incident. And I think this is a very critical time. You know, it's just months before the U.S. elections. What are you winking at? <laughs> 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 but yes, he it, was winking at me. I was winking. <laughs> and there, okay, there's no other meaning. <laughs> no. To, to that. no. Okay, wait, we continue. <laughs> no, I would say it's it's a very critical window of opportunity here because we're months away from the U.S. election, where right. we could see a transition yeah. in the U.S. administration. So I think this is a time when both countries really want to seize the opportunity to ensure that the waters are calm, that you know there isn't any potential crisis that could brew over the next few months that could kind of set the tone for the next four years. So mm. this is a time where they want to, you know, just stabilize things and make sure everything goes smoothly before that transition. Now, I, I know you guys have, can chime in on this too, right? So John Podesta's coming. They're yeah. talking climate too. And you've had some comments too around uh, the climate conversation in China. Well, Liu Jiamen is the new China envoy for climate, and right. he's going to be meeting uh, Podesta. Uh, uh, Liu went to Washington, met with Podesta there, hmm. uh, and now... Yes, yeah, it's a continuation of the meeting that they last had. So Podesta okay, is going go. to uh, Beijing in first first week of September, mm. so sometime next week, I suppose. And they're going to discuss, you know, how to reduce a range of greenhouse gas emissions going beyond carbon dioxide. And they're going also to discuss, you know, the new pledges that they are going to make, um, the goals that they would try to hit before 2035. And again, Beijing has always been facing pressures from all these developed countries to do a little bit more, given that they are the biggest greenhouse gas emitter. Given that, uh, although I 
have to say that China has been making a, a big strides on this front, you know, with their adoption of electric vehicles, their adoption of green energy here. Uh, and again, timing is of the essence here because if President Trump comes, comes into power, it could, you know, kind of, you know, just dismantle all these agreements. So the two sides are also looking to foster connections between the non-state, non-governmental institutions to ensure that any sort of cooperation could last beyond a change in the U.S. administration. Min Min, thank you so much. Min Min Lord, China correspondent there. Here's, uh, you know, in, in fact, just on, we'll take that as a jumping off point for a China brief today and some of the headlines uh, that we're seeing across national media. And if you're uh, looking at news, of course, and news on by John, uh, Jake Sullivan and the visit there, you won't find it on the front pages of Chinese domestic media. It's below the folds on page three of the Communist Party's official mouthpiece. The People's Daily, now the article describes the meeting with uh, the Foreign Minister Wang Yi as candid, substantive and constructive. Quoting Wang, it says that the U.S. and China should treat each other as equals for the relationship to be, to be smooth. Now elsewhere, there is criticism of the U.S. where an official said the military was open to escorting Philippine vessels during his resupply missions in the South China Sea. Uh, this is according to the Global Times, where the headline says that the U.S. is fanning the flames after uh, this U.S. Indo-Pacific commander Samuel Paparo made those comments. And it cites an unnamed military expert who says Washington does not want to see tensions easing because it supposedly needs the Philippines at the front line, Steve, here of its plan to contain China. Well, now a quick look at the business papers. The Security Times says selling pressure in the corporate bond market is manageable and there's little risk of more declines and fund redemptions. It cites stable liquidity near the end of this month and supportive monetary policy. And Caixin reports that some local districts are seeking to tap government assets as new revenue streams to ease debt pressures. It says one district in Chongqing plans to form a so-called sell everything to save the day task force to help monetize state-owned assets. A city also up in northwest Gansu has also called on local government-backed financing vehicles, LGFVs, to step up asset disposals. Right. Uh, back to markets and some individual movers. It's earnings, 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 earnings. Uh, the big theme today, SF holding here. Profit growth uh, is coming in slightly above the expectations you've seen in the stock price. Mungnyo, that's a buyback story, 8.7%, substantial gains there. Bocom, that's a profit miss. And Wuliang Ye, that's a 12%. Uh, a pop in net income from last year, also maintaining some of its sales momentum. Uh, some of the other earnings coming through, Lee Auto, that was a big mover, still is to the downside, substantial losses. I think we were looking at 15% drop there. Uh, let's just get a sense of where we are on that Lee Auto story. Earnings missing estimates were down only 9% or 10.5%. BYD Electronics, same story, same headline, missing estimates. Shunjo International, a textile producer here, down about 9%. That's also similar. Uh, sales disappointing there, although let's end on a positive note here with Meituan, of course, and that income beat there, plus, of course, the, buy the buyback too, Steve. Let's take you to last minute to Kagoshima and yep. the storm that is hitting there with sustained winds of 75 knots, 139 kilometers. Three dead, one missing right now. This is Bloomberg.